Okay, welcome back. Okay, so now this time what we're going to cover is section 1.2. We're going to talk about data and sampling. Okay, so now we have did a bird's eye view of this chapter, and now we're going to start diving in and, and dive deeper into it and get a worm's eye view of what's going on here. So we're going to start, that's the way the chapter is going to go, is uh, we start with the basics, we start with vocabulary, and we're going to get a little bit more detail. So now we're going to talk about data more specifically, and then we're going to talk about how do we get the data, the different sampling, how do we get the sample that we talked about before. Okay, so let's talk about data. Okay, let's start with data. Okay, and again, just like I said before, I'm not going to do a lot of writing when it comes to definitions and things like that because you can pause this and take your own notes. So I encourage you to please pause this, rewind it, listen to it again, and take notes as you go along. Okay. Um, so here's the data. Remember, we have two types of data. We have qualitative data. Okay, so again, this is going to be a little bit uh, uh, redundant from last time. So data, just like with variables, we have two types of variables. We have qualitative data. Okay, so we have qualitative. Or uh, non-numerical, so it's non Non-numerical, okay. Um, it's also categorical is another term. Okay. Um, it can uh, again uh, examples of this would be uh, hair color, blood type, right? So blood type would be an example of qualitative hair color. Uh, ethnic group, that would be another one. Okay. And the other type of data is quantitative. Quantitative. And this is numerical. Always numbers. Um, results of counting and measuring attributes of a population. So it's the results of counting. Counting or measuring. Certain attributes. Or variables of a population. Okay. So examples of this would be uh, temperature, volume, height. We talked about this again, so this would be volume, height. Um, and here's a, here would be an example. An example I would use would be uh, area. Okay, so if you wanted to do area of lawns in square feet. So if I wanted to look at, uh, that's what my variable is, the square footage or the area of lawns um, in square footage, then that would be an example of a quantitative variable. And it would also be a continuous variable because I'm talking about area. Okay, uh, another type of uh, um, data would be if I wanted uh, the number of machines in a gym. So I go to a gym, I count the number of machines, that's a numerical variable, but in that case that's a, um, a quantitative variable that's discrete. So continuous versus discrete as well. Okay, so I'll remember that. Um, let's see. Representative equals random, so we talked about that, so remember. So let's go back and talk about that for a moment. So one of the key aspects that we want from a sample is we want it to be representative. So remember, from a sample, we want a representative sample. Okay. 
That's king. So in other words, randomness. We want a random sample. One of the ways to get a representative sample is to make sure that we have a random sample. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay. So let me explain the different types of sampling methods that we're going to talk about in, in this section here. Okay. So this is going to probably be the bulk of this video, going through the different sampling methods. Okay, or sampling techniques. Okay, so the simplest one, which the name kind of gives it away, is the simple random sampling. So we're going to do sampling methods. Okay, the first one that I'm going to talk about is um, simple random sample. Okay, or abbreviated SRS. Okay, S simple random sampling involves where every outcome or every subject has an equally likely chance of being picked to be in the sample. And it's a very easy process. Basically what you're doing is you're assigning a number to every single individual in the population and then all you're doing is using a random number generator to pick a subset of those numbers. So basically, um, it's like names in a hat, right? You give everybody in the class a number, right? You have them count off by uh, numbers, one, two, three, all the way through. And then you pick all those numbers in a hat, and you shake it up really well, and you have somebody reach in there and grab five pieces of paper, and each number who uh, corresponds to a person in the class those five people would be in the sample. Okay, so that's really how it works. Okay, now there's lots of different ways of doing that. Um, names in a hat is a very crude way of doing it, uh, but again, it gets the point across of how it works. Typically, you could do this, like say, for students at a college. Students at a college, every student has a student ID. Well, if I wanted to find out how students feel about my class, I could take a random sample uh, because I can go back and say, hey, uh, all of the student IDs of all the students that have taken my class over the last few years, I could use a simple random number generator on my calculator or on Excel and say, okay, I'm, here's all of the student IDs. I'm going to randomly select a hundred of those student IDs and all of those students would be in my sample. Okay, so again, that's another way of doing it. Now, on the calculator, okay, so again, this, uh, a lot of times on the videos or in class, I'm going to show you how to do this on the calculator, okay? So, the way you do this on the calculator is very easy. Uh, you're going to go to math. Okay, so you're going to go to the math. You're going to hit the math key, okay? And then you're going to go to the probability menu. So you're going to go over to the PRB, probability, menu, and then you're going to choose number five on the menu, which is rand int. Okay, now what that means? That, that means I'm going to randomly choose an integer, just a whole number. Okay, there's another rand key on there, but that's a little different. But this is the number five rand int. So how what so how do I use this rand int? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to put it on my screen. Rand int with an open with an open brace. Okay, now what I have to put into this open brace is I have to put two things in there. Okay, uh, the beginning number and the ending number of my interval of where I want to choose my integer from. So if I want to choose a random number from 0 to 100, then I just put 0 to 100. So when I hit enter,
then it's going to just give me some random number between 0 and 100. Okay, so if I hit enter, I could get 57. And then if I hit enter again, I could get 16. And if every time I hit enter, I keep hitting enter, I'm going to get numbers and numbers and numbers. So let's say I wanted to sample 100 people, and let's say I wanted 10 numbers, 10 people. Then I would just hit enter, and I would keep hitting enter until I had 10 numbers. Obviously, if I get the same number out, let's say down here I get 16 again, I wouldn't count that one because I've already chosen it. It could happen. Most likely in this case it won't happen. But if it does, you just ignore it and you do it again until you have 10 unique numbers. Okay? And that's how that works. So you can change these numbers. You could do 1 to 30, 5 to 10, 5 to 100, 100 to 332, whatever you want to choose. Okay, that's how the rand int function works. Okay? Okay, so that's how you do a simple random sample. That is a simple random sample method. Okay, the second one that I'm going to discuss is systematic sampling. Okay. Systematic sampling, again, by its name, kind of gives it away how it works. Okay? You start with some kind of starting point. Okay? That starting point is de determined by a value, and the value is k. Okay? Or excuse me, let me start over. You can start anywhere um, in your sampling process. What I mean is, uh, well, let me just say it and then I'll, I'll explain it. Okay, so you, you start, you have some starting point. Okay, that's, it's not really important where you start. Okay, but then you have your k value. Okay, that is important. Okay, and the way systematic sampling works is it's very systematic. So once you know where you're starting, once you have your starting point, let's say I have a list of individuals. Let's say I have a flight and I have the, the um, oh, what do they call it? The, um, oh, I'm having a brain fart. The um, list of passengers, uh, I forget what that's called. But anyway, they have a list of passengers and let's say, it doesn't matter where I start, let's just say I pick a spot, I'm going to start there, and let's say I have a passenger number uh, for each one. Okay, so I just start with a uh, point. The K is how many I'm going to skip, or every K person or individual or subject that I'm going to choose to be in my sample. So let's say I start with here, and I go, okay, I'm going to go to the next kth person, and then the next kth person, and so on and so forth. So it's very systematic, okay? Okay, so here's an example. Um, let's say k is equal to 7. And let's take the, the um, airline example again for the, air, the flight, okay? So let's say I have 255 people on a flight, and I'm interested in getting customer satisfaction feedback, and I want a random sample of 30 of the people to survey, to ask them to, you know, to fill out a survey. So, well, let's say my, my K is 7. So that means I'm going to start, let's say I just start with the first person, okay? And I'm going to go, I'm going to count every seventh person down the line until I have my 30 people, okay? So what's 30 people? Okay, 30 people, which we represent as n, that's my sample size. Okay, so this is the sample size. Okay, so lowercase n represents my sample size. And incidentally, just so you know this, the population size, if we did know the population, is represented by capital N. Okay, so n, here would be the population size. Okay, 
lowercase n is the sample size. So in this case, my, I want a sample size of 30, k is equal to 7, so what I would do is I would just start with the first person and I would count every seventh person until I had my 30 people and that would be my sample. Okay? That's how simple uh, systematic sampling works. The third method of sampling is convenience sampling. Convenience sampling. Well, again, this is one where the name gives it away. This, it's very convenient. There's not a lot of work to do to get your sample. Okay? Convenience sampling is, examples of convenience sampling would be uh, standing um, at the uh, entrance. of a store and surveying people as they came in or came out. That would be an example of convenience sampling. Why? Because all you're doing is standing there and it's very convenient. As they leave and as they come, you're just asking them, hey, would you like to fill out a survey? Um, and they can either say yes or no. So you're not doing very much work to do that. Okay. Another example of convenience sampling would be, let's say I'm in a manufacturing uh, environment and I'm an inspector, quality assurance inspector, and I want to um, get a sample of product for quality assurance purposes. Well, one way of doing it is randomly selecting the first hundred units that come off the belt. Okay, So that would be another example of a convenient sampling. So just sampling the first hundred units that come off the belt of an assembly, assembly line. Now the thing about convenient sampling is that it is convenient but it's it, but it can't, it usually is not representative of the sample. So therefore, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, we're going to talk about bias, okay? So convenience sampling tends to not be representative of the sample, okay? Okay. Now the next thing, the next sampling method that I want to talk about is cluster sampling. So the last two sampling methods are similar, but very different. Okay, so the way you want to look at these next two is to compare what makes them different. Okay, so let's talk about cluster sampling. Cluster sampling involves what we define as a cluster. What is a cluster or clusters? Clusters are groups that are similar. So we're talking about similar groups, okay, or homogeneous groups as another term, okay? Groups that are basically the same. They have the same characteristics, okay? So in cluster sampling, we have similar groups. Now, of the groups, what we're going to do is we're going to randomly select a subset of the groups. Okay, it could be one of the clusters, it could be two of the clusters, it could be three, whatever, it, as long as it's a subset of the, all of the different clusters in the population. Okay? Once we have our sample, then what we're going to do is we're going to survey all individuals
in the sample. Okay? So everyone in the subset in the sample gets surveyed. Okay? So cluster sampling. Similar groups. We randomly select a subset of the groups, the clusters, and then once we have our sample, everyone gets surveyed. Okay? Okay. So here's an example. Let's say, um, try to think, let's say, let's say I'm interested in surveying college students in a biology class. Okay? And let's say I have, um, Let's say I have 10 sections of the biology class. This is biology 101. Let's say I have 10 sections of the biology class. Okay? And I want to get an idea of uh, student feedback on the class, of, let's say of some, some kind. Okay? Well, if I'm in a, a biology 101 class, most likely a lecture has about 200 students, uh, let's say, at each lecture. So you're looking at a couple thousand students in 10 sections at a, at a large university like, uh, like U of I, let's say, just as an example. Okay, so he, I can look at each one of those biology classes for the semester as a cluster because they're pretty much the same. They're biology students. They're going to be made up of the same types of students from the same um, basic majors and so on and so forth. Okay, so I can look at each one of those classes as a cluster. So if I have these clusters, right? And they're basically the same size, let's say. Okay, it doesn't matter, but let's say they're basically the same size, same makeup. And so here's my 10 clusters. Okay. So now, instead of surveying all of the students, all I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, randomly pick, three of the 10 clusters. And so now, once I have my three clusters, then I'm going to basically send an email out to all of the students in these three classes asking them to take a five-minute survey, let's say. That's an example of cluster sampling. Okay? So now, the last one is a little different, uh, but also similar in the fact that we're also dealing with individual groups within a population, okay? So that type of sampling method is called stratified. Sampling, okay? So how does stratified sampling work? Well, stratified sampling works like this. So we have groups, okay? We have groups but they're not the same, they're not similar, they're different. So we have different groups. Okay, different groups. Uh, don't have to be, but usually different sizes as well. Okay, different groups, different sizes. And so in this case here, we want to make sure, again, remember, representative sample. We want to make sure that all of the different groups are represented, represented in our sample. Okay, especially if they're different sizes, a simple random sampling method may not be the best method to get us a representative sample because there may be one group that's small enough where it doesn't even get ex uh, included. Well, in this type of example, or in this case, a stratified sampling method would guarantee a representative sample where all of the groups would have a say, okay, in, in the survey, okay? So, now we have different groups. We're gonna select a 
sample from each group uh, how do I want to say that? Select a sample from each group proportional to the percent makeup of population, of the population. Okay, what does this mean? Let me kind of bring this out. Um, because different groups may be different sizes, the proportion of the groups are going to be different, most likely. So representative sample, we want to make sure that the proportion, the proportions of the different groups are the same in the sample as in the population. So that's what we mean. We're going to, we're going to basically, we're going to make sure we select a sample from each one of the different groups so that when we combine all of those little samples, that the actual sample we get is going to have the same makeup as the population. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay. So now the last part is we're going to add all the samples together as our final sample. Okay, and then we're going to survey the individuals in that sample. And that's stratified sampling methods. So the idea is we have different groups. This is going to be strata. This is what we call the strata. So in the similar groups, in cluster sampling, we, we called the different groups clusters because they're pretty much the same. In stratified sampling, because the groups are different, we call the different strata. So an example in this case might be something like this. Okay, so here's an example of one way. Let's say we have a um, Let's say we have a high school. Could be a high school. Let's say we have a high school. Okay. Okay. And in this high school, we have a thousand students. Okay. Well, let's say two thousand. We have two thousand students. Okay. Now we know that of the two thousand students, we have. I'm just making these numbers up. Uh, let's say we have um, about um, 632 freshmen. We have um, 601 sophomores. We have, let's say, 500 um, juniors, and we have, let's see, uh, how many does that leave? Uh, 12, 17, 33, so we end up with seniors, so sophomores, so seniors. We have, uh, so again, 12, uh, 17, well, not a lot of seniors, so we have 1733, we have 267 seniors. Um, not very good, I don't know, but anyway, so let's just use this as an example, okay? Now, we definitely have different groups in this case, so here's our strata, okay? Now, and just make sure this adds up to... Yes, it is. Okay, so it adds up to 2,000. Okay, so now, we want to make sure that we have a representative sample. So we have different groups, 
We want to make sure all the different groups are represented. So this is the way we would employ stratified sampling method. Okay? So we would need to find out what the percent breakdown is for each group. So how do we do that? Well, we use what's called relative frequency. Right? We're going to find the relative frequency for each one of these groups. So we're going to take each one of these numbers and divide by 2,000. Okay? So we're going to take 632 divided by 2,000. We're going to take um, 601 divided by 2,000, 500 divided by 2,000, and 267 divided by 2,000. Okay, so what does this turn out to be? Well, this turns out to be here is going to be uh, 316. 316. Uh, so this is going to be 31.6%. This is going to be 30.5%. Uh, this is going to be 25%. And this is going to be um, uh, 1. So it's going to be 13.35%. Okay, so all of these, these should add up to 100% or very close to it. So that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 9, 8, 9, 9, um, 0.05 percent. Sorry. Uh, so nine nine six. So that's nine, and then five five. So uh, yes. So it adds up to 100 percent. Okay, good. So now, now that we have the uh, the percentages, we want to make sure that we select the right numbers that correspond to these percentages. Well, how are how are we going to do that? Well, let's say we want 100 people. We want a sample size of 100. Okay. Well, what does that mean? It means that approximately 31 people should come from the freshmen because it's 31.6%. So I used 100 just to make it easy. So 31.6 or about 32 uh, students should be selected from the freshmen. So what, what are we going to do? We're going to randomly select 32 students. Well, how are we going to randomly select those? Well, we can use a simple random sampling method. Why not? So we're going to randomly select 32 from the freshmen. Okay. Now, to make sure that there's 30% uh, sophomores, we're going to randomly select 30 students from the sophomores. Okay. And then we're going to randomly select 25 students from the juniors. Oops, 25. And then we're going to randomly select 13 students from the seniors. And then if we take all of these, we get 100. And we have our sample. And that's how stratified sampling works. OK. Next topic. Now, so now that we've talked about sampling and the different sampling methods, now let's talk about uh, error. And let's talk about bias. Okay, so sampling error. Oops. Sampling error is the fact that we're going to have error anytime we sample data. 
Okay, so it's caused by the process of sampling. It's unavoidable. Okay, it's uncontrolled. Okay, it's just error by the fact whenever we sample data, we're going to have some error in it. It's unavoidable. Okay, there's that sampling error. Now, non sampling error is different. That is error that's caused by um, things that are within our control, things that we can avoid, right? Sampling error is unavoidable. It's just caused by the fact that we're sampling data, okay? Non-sampling error is things that can be avoided. Um, for example, a device, a measuring device that is not working correctly. Uh, could cause non-sampling error, okay? Uh, a machine that's not calibrated correctly could cause non-sampling error. It's not measuring correctly, okay? Um, what else do I have here? Oh, human error. Okay, that's, that's another one, human error. Somebody transposed two numbers when they were measuring it. They wrote down the information wrong or they, they forgot to write it down. Okay, all of those things are examples of non-sampling error, things that could be avoided. Okay, um, let's see here. Sampling bias, okay. Let's talk about sampling bias for a moment. I mentioned it earlier, but let me repeat. Sampling bias is where one group or category has a higher or less likely of occurring. More has a higher probability or a, a, a less probability. In other words, the outcomes for each group are not equally likely. Okay? That's what we mean by bias. So sampling bias is any sampling method, uh, any bias that's inherent from sampling data. Okay? I talked about um, convenience sampling. Convenience sampling tends to be biased because it's not representative. You usually don't get a representative sample. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about different types of bias in a moment, but just understand that the definition of bias is that not everyone is equally likely okay, to be chosen. Okay, so types of bias. I'm going to talk about the three most common ones that we run into. Okay. So non-response bias. Okay. Non-response bias are sometimes called undercoverage. Okay. Non-response bias is caused by the fact that either people don't want to respond to a survey, they don't want to participate in a survey, or they don't want to be in the sample, or they cannot be in the sample for whatever reason. Okay, so therefore their opinion is not being counted. Okay, hence non response bias because they may have an opinion, but they may not be, they don't want to be in the study or they want, don't want to be in the sample, and therefore their opinion isn't counted. Where other people who do feel strongly one way or the other are do put in there, and so there may be an under coverage of people, or for example. They can't be in the study. They have no way of knowing about the study. Okay, so those are examples, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Causes of non-response bias. Okay, uh, let me see if I have an example. Okay. Um, Uh, let's see here. Yeah, the only thing I have is the collected responses may not be representative of the population. Often people with strong positive or negative opinions may answer surveys which can affect results. For example, 
if I'm if I ask a question, let's say I, I post something on Facebook, and I want to get people's opinions on Facebook uh, regarding a social issue. Well, there are going to be people who don't want to be in the survey, don't really care that much about it. They have a they they have a, an opinion, but they just don't want to do surveys. Like me, I just don't do surveys. I have opinions about things, but I'm just not going to take the time to fill out a Facebook survey or an internet survey or any kind of survey. Um, but then there are, is a group of people who can't answer that question. Can you think of a group of people that would not be able to be part of that um, survey even if they wanted to? What group of people would not to be able to answer that Facebook survey? People who don't have access to the internet, right? So that would be a group of people that cannot be part of the survey. Make sense? Okay. Here's another group. Homeless people, right? Not only do they have not have access to the internet, they don't have access to a home, right? So they don't even have an address if you wanted to mail them a survey. Okay. So the next one that I want to talk about is voluntary response bias. So voluntary response bias, or what we call self-selection, self-selected, is the idea that people will choose to be part of a survey or not. Again, so this is related in one, in, in one way to non-response bias because it's voluntary. So you put a, like, for, let's use the Facebook um, poll I was talking about, Facebook survey, right? People answering those questions is completely voluntary. They don't have to, right? So it's only those people who really feel strongly one way or the other is going to bother taking the time to answer the survey, click on the button, call the phone number, right? So that's what we mean by voluntary response bias because only those people who feel strongly are going to call in and that may affect the results. It may be lopsided one way or the other depending on who calls in, okay? That may not be indicative of the entire population as far as the what the population opinion is, okay? Um, oh, this happens a lot when you look at um, political stuff, when you look at uh, political maps, right? If you look at, for example, Illinois. If you look at Illinois, which is a blue state by the all intents and purposes, but if you look at the state by county, you see that the biggest uh, popul or density of Democrats are all located within the Chicago land area. But if you look at it in the entire, uh, by county, if you look at all the counties of the entire state, it is by far, um, the, by county, Republican, okay? And you'll see the big vast of the um, blue in the, in the uh, Chicago land area because that's where the dense population is. So, you know, you have like, what, 10, uh, 5 million people in the metro area, 10 million in the Chicago land area. So that's uh, the metro area and the surrounding suburbs. Um, but that doesn't count for all the entire population of Illinois. Okay? Okay. So anyway, so the next one and the last one as far as uh, bias that we're going to talk about is convenience bias bias. And convenience sampling method, is, uh, the convenience bias comes from the convenience sampling method. So convenience bias. Okay. And that's bias that's inherent in using the convenience sampling method. Okay. Because why the people you, that you talk to at the supermarket may not represent in the uh, population of the city or state or town that you're you're in okay they may be shopping there and they may live in a different town they may be visiting from out of state and they went to the store to buy something okay so again so that's that's convenience bias
Okay. Um, let's see here. What else? Ah, okay, so now let's change topics and now let's talk about variation. Okay, so we talked about sampling, we talked about sampling methods, we talked about bias. Now let's talk about variation. Okay, variation is present in all data and samples. Okay. What is variation? Variation is the fact that as I take sample and sa after sample after sample from a population, the statistics are going to change. That's the variation. And there's natural variation in all sampling methods. You, like that's the sampling error. Okay? You're going to have natural variation. Okay? So let's consider a population. Okay? So if we take a random sample, uh, a random sample of size n, so we take a, a, a population, okay, some population, and let's say we have some parameter, and we'll say, let's say the population mean, mu, okay? So we we have the population mean. And let's say we take a random sample of size n. And we calculate the sample mean x bar 1. So let's say this is the first sample. Okay? Now, question for you. Is my sample mean going to be equal to the population mean for the sample? Well, the answer is no, it's not. Chances are it's very unlikely that I take a random sample and my sample statistic, my x bar, my statistic, will equal my parameter. Okay? That's because of sampling error, okay? Variation, okay? Now, what if I take another sample of n, same size, and I calculate my sample mean for that one? So that's x bar 2. So here's a question. Is x bar 2 going to be equal to mu? And again, the answer is no. It's not going to be equal. Okay. Now here's the second question. Is x bar 1, the, the mean of my first sample, going to equal x bar 2, the mean of my second sample? And the answer is no. It's not. Because again, if I take a random sample and I calculate the average, and then I take another random sample and I calculate the average, chances are those two averages are not going to be the same because of variation, okay? And in fact, if I keep taking samples, of the same size, chances are none of those sample means, none of those statistics are going to be the same. And none of those statistics are probably going to equal the parameter that I'm interested in. Okay? And that's because of variation. And variation is one of the key concepts to understand. And it's what makes things run in statistics. And in fact, when we get to probability, it's going to be the thing that makes statistics work. We're going to, when the randomness comes in. You know, this idea of variation. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so here, let me ask you this question now. Okay, so now, what if, what if I take larger samples? What if my, what if I increase the sample size for each of these? What do you think is going to happen to my statistics? Or if I just go back to one sample, okay, let's just go back to one sample again. 
Okay, so what if I take my sample, instead of using a sample of size n, let's say of 50, let's say I take sample sizes of 100, or 200, or 1,000. Okay, what do you think is going to happen to my statistic? Well, there's the law of large numbers, and the law of large numbers basically says that as my sample size increases, the value of my uh, statistic will get closer and closer to the value of the parameter that I'm interested in. So it becomes better and better estimate. And if you think about it, this should make sense intuitively because if I keep increasing the size of my sample, right, and I calculate x bar, and then let's say I take another sample of n3 and I calculate x bar. And I keep increasing my sample. What's happening? Well, if you notice, my sample is taking up more and more of the population. So how big could my sample be? Theoretically, it could be equal to the population. So it should make sense that as my sample gets bigger and bigger, my statistic should get closer and closer to what the actual value of the parameter is. In this case, the population mean. Okay, so that's the idea of the law of large numbers. Okay. <coughs> okay. So now, let's talk about the last topic and then we'll end uh, this section. Okay, the last topic has to do with critical thinking and when it comes to statistical studies. Okay, so I'm going to go through these and I'm going to talk about them, um, but these are under the title Critical Evaluations of Statistical Studies. Okay. Now, so here are some of the problems with sample. So here's some of the things you have to be wary of uh, when it comes to statistical studies. So always, these are things that you want to check. Okay, so these are some of the common problems uh, with uh, statistical, statistical studies. Okay, so the first thing is problems with the samples. Okay, that goes back to what we talked about representative. Again, if the samples are not representative, it calls into question the reliability of your results. Okay, so if you have bias, remember, if you have bias in a sample, your results will be unreliable and invalid. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have random samples, we want to make sure that we have representative samples. The second thing, so again, problems, so problems with samples. That's one place that you might have problems. Okay. Self-selected samples, we talked about that one. Sample size issues. Okay, keep in mind, and we'll talk about this later, but keep in mind that if your sample size is too small, then that will also call into question the reliability of your results and your results will be invalid. Now, there are certain circumstances where you cannot get away from using a small sample. Now, in those cases, you can still draw conclusions, and we'll talk more about this in later chapters, but realize that when we talk about sample size issues, Typically, if you have too small of a sample, then your results are going to be unreliable. So we want to make sure we have our, our large enough sample sizes. Okay? Okay. 
The next thing is under uh, undue influence. Undue influence. So what's undue influence? It's when you collect data or you ask questions in a manner that influences the result or outcome of the collection or the, the uh, response. Okay, So it's either dealing with the, the way you collect the data or the way you ask a question in an interview or in a survey that could lead somebody or have an effect on how somebody responds to the question or the result of your data set. Okay, that would be undue influence. So an example, um, when you ask a question on a survey, we want to make sure that our survey questions are unbiased. Um, they don't lead to a particular uh, question, uh, answer. So leading questions, biased questions, same, same thing. Okay, so that's what we mean by undue influence. Or in an interview, the way a person asks a question could lead somebody to a particular answer, and we don't want to do that either, okay? Uh, the other one is non-response, okay? We talked about that. Okay, uh, the next one is causality. Okay, so causality, let me actually erase this and start over. So causality is another uh, thing to watch out for. What's causality? Well, that's the, that's the mistake that some people make when they go from an association, a correlation between two variables to the conclusion that one variable is causing the other variable. Okay? So again, so what does that mean? It means that you have to remember that correlation does not equal causation. Okay. Just because two variables are highly correlated, meaning that one, they're very, uh, they're very closely associated, so associated with each other, doesn't mean that one variable is causing another variable. It could be, but not necessarily. It could be a coincidence. Or there could be a third variable, what we call a lurking variable, that's causing both. We'll talk about that in experimental studies. Okay. Um, so again, there could be a lurking variable. Or what we call a confounding variable, same thing. Confound means to confuse. So confounding variable. So confounding means to confuse the results. Okay. Okay. Uh, misleading use of data. Oh, this is another one to watch out for. Misleading use of data. Okay. Improperly displayed graphs. So improper graphs. Okay. That would be a misuse of data, misleading use of data. Incomplete data. You don't have all the data. You deleted it or you're not using all the data. That's you know, so incomplete data for whatever reason, okay? You're not using all the data because, you know, let's say you're deleting data because you want to get the data to, to say what you want it to say. That's bad, okay? Um, so we got to make sure we look at studies to make sure that they're not misleading us by not including all of the data, okay? It does happen, okay? Um, lack of context. If we don't know the proper context of what the study is doing, then that's going to lead us to wrong conclusions. So we need to make sure we have the correct context of the, the, of the study. So lack of context. Okay, and then the last thing is confounding. Okay. Is there or could there be another variable that is causing both 
of the results or all of the results, okay? So if I have two variables, x and y, and I'm seeing a correlation between the two, then confounding comes in that what, oh, let's, let me put it this way, let me start over. Confounding is, if I have many, many factors, okay, so if I have a bunch of factors that could be affecting a response, and I don't know which of the factors really truly is causing the response, causing what I'm seeing in the response uh, variable, then that's confounding. There's confusion. I don't know if it's this factor or that factor. So one of the things that we do when we talk about cons uh, statistical studies, the only way to eliminate that confounding is to do an experiment where we can isolate the different uh, variables, the different factors, and then we can see by isolating the individual factors in, in an experiment, we can see which factor truly is having the effect. Okay, so again, that goes back up to this causality. The only way we can reach a conclusion about causation that we can truly prove that one variable is caused by another variable is to do an experiment. Okay, and then that's really what we're going to do in the next section. Okay, um, so that ends this section. In the next section, we're going to talk about experimental studies and designs, and we'll, we'll uh, pretty much end the chapter with, uh, with that. So again, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.